Just ahead on American Black Journal, a new nonprofit organization in Detroit is helping connect job seekers with employers. We'll talk with the president of Detroit Employment Solutions Corporation about the agency services and job opportunities in the city. Plus, one of the most important fundraisers at the DIA is coming up next month. We'll hear all about this year's Bal African Gala supporting African and African American art at the museum. That's all coming up now. Lindsay wants to know. So I'm curious, what's DT Energy doing to improve their customer service? Why don't we take a ride over there and let Rachel tell us. Hello. Hello. Take a walk with me. Here at DT Energy, we're working very hard to improve our service, like answering every call under one minute and resolving the issue on the first call. Wow, no passing the buck, huh? Nope. And plus, we're adding over 100 customer service jobs right here in the state of Michigan. I need to get a real job. I'm going to send your application. Thanks, Rachel. DTE Energy. Know your own power. Welcome to American Black Journal, I'm Stephen Henderson. Last year, the functions of the city's Workforce Development Department were transferred to a nonprofit organization. Detroit Employment Solutions Corporation is the new agency servicing the needs of job seekers and employers in Detroit. Recently, Meyer selected Detroit Employment Solutions to help recruit workers to fill 400 jobs at its new store at 8 Mile and Woodward. Here to talk more about that partnership and the agency services is President and CEO Pamela Moore. Welcome to American Black Thank Journal. Thank you, Stephen. So, so when we've been talking about this kind of thing for a long time in Detroit, and it's not always uh, non-controversial. A lot of people uh, sort of bristle at the idea that uh, maybe nonprofits or private uh, enterprises can do things that the city uh, that the city is doing. Why, why is it a good idea to, to take workforce development and push it outside of uh, city government this oh, way? And so there are a number of services that historically the city has offered and uh, Mayor Bing had to ask the question, what services does the city need to stay in? due to right. the, what is the fiscal core challenge, right. right, what are those core services? And workforce development, when you look across the country, about half of workforce agencies are uh, performed out of a nonprofit structure. Okay. Uh, it allows you to be much more efficient, much more effective. Just the cost of doing business under the city of Detroit was very expensive. Fringe benefit rates are very high. Sure. And so we found that we saved approximately 25% in operating costs just by moving the operations away from the city. Right. So that was one benefit. And at the end of the day, we're trying to get the services to the citizens and the employers in the city of Detroit and get those grant dollars spent. Right. Because we never want to spend, um, not spend, excuse me, grant dollars and have to send those dollars back to the funding agency. Right. And workforce development is something that uh, both the state and federal government provide grant dollars. That's to the correct. City for a majority of our dollars come from the federal uh, agencies and those dollars, many of them flow through the state, through the state and they're allocated sure. across the state. Okay. And so let's uh, let's talk about what workforce development is. Uh, what does that mean uh, in your agency? So we provide training and employment services to young people in the city of Detroit. We have a wonderful year-round youth program. There's mentoring, there's after-school tutoring. Um, we service adults through our one-stop service centers. So if you feel that you need training, you're looking for employment, you need to up your skills, you come into a one-stop service center and get those services. And then employers, that's our priority customer. Yeah. We're a demand-driven system, so we go and sit with employers and see what their talent needs are, and that's how we focus our resources and our training programs right. based on the demand. And in Detroit, this is, this. I mean, we can say it's not a core government service, but it's a critical, Absolutely. it's a critical function. Absolutely. The unemployment rate in Detroit yeah. um, is around 20 percent. That is the documented rate. Right. However, it's, probably a lot higher, it's right? a lot higher. I would say that it's probably double that. And yeah. so we have to get Detroiters back to work in order for the city to thrive and for the economic development activities to really make a difference, we have to touch the average citizen in the city of Detroit. Right. Uh, a lot of uh, what we hear about Detroit, too, is that uh, there are a lot of jobs that we it's uh, that it's difficult to find people to fill because maybe they don't quite have the skills uh, that those jobs require. And that's true. So we focus on five sectors that were determined by the Workforce Development Agency at the state of Michigan. 
and those five sectors are healthcare, IT, manufacturing, agriculture, and energy. And I would say when you look at the board of what the current demand is in Detroit, the um, most growing sectors and jobs in Detroit proper are IT, healthcare related, and manufacturing. So we need engineers, we need IT professionals, we need registered nurses, and we need truck drivers. Right. I think those are the top four. Yeah. So there is a huge skills gap um, and a huge demand, not only in Detroit, but across the country for those IT positions. Engineers, a lot of our engineers left the state. Are gone, um, right. Once, once the industry um, kind of went belly up. Um, so, so there is a huge demand that we are currently not able to fill and so again that's how we focus our training dollars and our training programs to try to upskill and dislocated workers that are out there that have work experience and maybe just need to be trained in another area. Right, right. Um, so that's what we're focused on. I mean, on. do you find that in, in a lot of your work uh, you're filling gaps that, that uh, we, we see that have been left by our, our schools, for example. I mean, that's one of our big problems in Detroit is that uh, people are leaving school not prepared for work or college. That's and so absolutely right. So, so when we look at our young people, we know that there's a whole network of services that they need. And, and a piece that, that we saw was missing was the connection between workforce development and the high schools. Uh, so right. when young people um, are making plans for, for their future and talk with counselors, typically counselors are talking about college. Well, a lot of our young people in Detroit are not ready it's to go not, to college, yeah. can't afford college. Um, and so we're going into the schools in the fall. We're going into five EAA high schools and into four DPS high schools and bringing a whole career awareness and readiness program. We're going to offer some dual enrollment opportunities with community colleges. We're going to put them on a career track, see what their interests are, put them on a career track that will take them beyond high school and get them ready. We're going to do a readiness credential for them, um, give them some training opportunities. We're going to make them work about 10 hours a week. We're going to keep them <laughs> very busy yeah. and they will be very prepared when they uh, graduate to either go to college or go to a two-year institution or go right into a job. Right. Uh, and let's talk about employers a little bit in Detroit. We've seen some job growth uh, for the first time in a long time with people locating uh, in the city and opening, uh, you know, cross our fingers, soon we'll see some retail yes. uh, pop up. That, that's got to change your work as well. It does change our work and all of the activity downtown, all of the economic development activity downtown. So there are a lot of professionals moving into downtown Detroit and into mm -hmm. Midtown. But those professionals need services. So you're going to see a lot more restaurants. You're going to see a lot more growth in the service industry. Right. And so and those are the low skilled jobs that, that we need to fill. Um, but again, we you know, the, the education attainment in, in Detroit, the high school graduate right. re graduation rate, those are, those are issues that we must address. Um, companies relocate based on the talent and based on uh, real estate sure. and based on a number of issues, but talent is a huge, huge uh, component that drives economic development. And so we have to get Detroiters trained in, into these jobs and ready for the opportunities that are not only here today, but coming, but coming. in the next two, three, four, five years, yeah. all of the construction projects that are coming to Detroit. Uh, we took a look at the skilled trade membership in Southeast Michigan. There are about 17,000 members uh, in Southeast Michigan that are really prepared to go into those skilled trade opportunities when they come right. in one rail. The bridge, the bridge. Uh, hockey stadium, sure. Eastern Market has some activity, um, but they're going to be spin-off jobs. And so what are those jobs and how do we prepare Detroiters to fill those jobs? Right. How often do you find that, that uh, people in Detroit uh, are ready to work, trained uh, for a job, but maybe don't uh, know about the opportunities and can't sort of can't connect. I mean, uh, one of the things I'm thinking of is the sort of digital divide. If you don't have a computer or an iPad or something right now, a lot of jobs you're not going to find. It's not like uh, people, you know, uh, advertising the newspaper anymore. That's very I wish true. they would, but <laughs> that's very true. So the way we find employment is very different than it was when you and I grew, grew up. Um, and so a lot of our customers are are, are individuals that don't have uh, access to computers in their homes yeah. and are not. Um, as savvy as, as they could be and so we have workshops and training for that. 
Um, but again, uh, the resources are scarce, and so we work with community-based organizations. We have access centers in neighborhoods, mm -hmm. in churches, where people can come in, use the computers, look at the Michigan Talent Connect um, listing of what jobs are available, and come into our centers and either get assistance in finding those jobs and connecting to those jobs, or get assistance preparing to go into those jobs. Sure. Uh, the the year-round year -round youth uh, employment program uh, you guys run, is, it seems like that's got to be pretty critical in the summer, it's, keeping it's, kids busy. It's very critical. Yeah. So one of the components is a six-week summer work experience. Uh -huh. And, of course, uh, Skillman and City Connect, they raise private dollars to put young people into a six-week work experience over the summer. So that summer component is, is important, but we feel that year-round piece is even more important to get kids um, active in after-school programs to get them tutoring, leadership development, um, and we case manage our, our young people. And so right. we know the outcomes at the end of, of, of our programs. We either have to exit you into post-secondary um, institutions or into a job. Or into a job, right. And, and, that's, and that's one of those sort of critical uh, sort of undercurrents in the, in the city is making sure that kids have some place that they're headed for and some place, something to do uh, when they're done with school. It will impact crime rates, it will impact our quality of life. Young people um, need us to really step up and provide some opportunities and wrap our arms around them yeah. and let them know that we care about them and here are some, here are some opportunities for you um, and some alternatives so that you can stop making some bad choices. Right, right. Uh, you know, it's interesting you say that. Uh, almost every guest I have uh, on the show who works in the city says that same thing. That that's what these kids really need is somebody who says, look, I'm going to help you out. I'm going to make sure you're doing Absolutely. the things you're doing. Absolutely. Great work. Congratulations on the, you, what Steven. this is a big step. Uh, it was uh, a big step. Yeah. It was. Um, it was uh, uh, politically. It was. It was uh, interesting yeah, to right. do this. Um, and and Mayor Bing supported us every step of That's the right. way. That's right. It's one of the he things he really He has the authority through the Workforce Investment Act legislation uh, to select the administrative and fiscal agent who delivers these programs and right. services. And so we appreciate his support and just um, being the champion in right. this effort. And right. so we are. We are nine months old now, and things could not be better. Right. Well, congratulations. Thank you. Just ahead on American Black Journal, VIA's Friends of African and African American Art are celebrating their 50th anniversary. We'll talk about their signature fundraiser in June and the special guest who's being honored at the event. That's all coming up next. One of the Detroit Institute of Art's oldest and highest regarded auxiliary organizations is the Friends of African and African American Art. The group raises money to buy significant works of art created by African and African American artists. Each year they hold their signature fundraiser celebrating the cultural heritage of the African diaspora. Val Afrikan is one of the DIA's most important and well-attended events. Proceeds are used to purchase art collections and support the programs and lectures sponsored by the Friends of African and African American Art. This year's gala takes place on June 15th at the DIA. The special guest of honor is actor, director, producer, and political activist Danny Glover. His stage and screen career span more than 25 years. So joining me now are Gail Ross, who's the chair of the Friends of African and African American Art, and Valerie Mercer, who's the curator and department head for the DIA's General Motors Center for African American and art. Welcome to American Black Journal. Thank you. So this Thank is you. this is one of the great events uh, every year oh, in the city. Oh, it absolutely is. It is a magnificent event. It's very colorful um, because it's a black tie event, right. but it's also African. Right. So right. you come in your traditional African garb and whatever you'd like, but it is a phenomenal event. There's live music, there's dancing, there's exotic foods. Right. Uh, there's all the things that you need in an event like that. Right. And uh, Danny Glover, tell me about why he's the the special guest this Danny year. Glover's a special actor. Yeah, right. Um, no kidding. Not only, you, you said it all. Not only does he direct, he, he produces, 
Um, he is a political activist. He is a humanitarian. Right. He is a philanthropist. He is, I could go on and on, he's an ambassador <laughs> right. for UNICEF. Right. Um, he's involved in many, many organizations. Right. And so his role in the, in the gala, I mean, you'll give him an award, He is correct? absolutely. Yes. He will get an award. Yeah. Um, but he is our special guest. Yeah. Um, if you attend the, the gala and you attend the VIP reception, you'll get a picture with him. Right. Um, he's a very prolific yes. person, yes. not just actor. Right, <laughs> yeah. right, yeah. right. Uh, let's talk about some of the the, the art that this uh, that this gala benefits. That's one of the the really cool parts of the museum, at least in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Oh, sure. Well, you could see a lot of that art in the galleries for African American art at the Detroit Institute of Arts. Um, we have about five ga galleries dedicated to African American art uh, and works by um, artists such as uh, Elizabeth Catlett, mm -hmm. Sam Gilliam, Robert Colescott, uh, quite a number. Of right. Them. Yeah. Uh, you'll see on the labels that the purchase of those works were made possible by um, fu funds from uh, the Friends of African and African American Art. Right, right. And they also help us do uh, programs related to the work of those artists with uh, the artists themselves or scholars. Right, right. Uh, the 50th anniversary, I mean, that's a long, that's a long time to have been Absolutely. around. What was, what was the museum like for African and African American art before you guys started raising money for that? You hear crickets? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> nothing. nothing. It wasn't Absolutely there. Huh? Nothing. There was nothing there. Right. So the auxiliary is 50 years old. It's mm -hmm. we're moving into our 51st year, mm -hmm. but it was. It is dedicated to showing those art that art across the diaspora. Right. Not just. It's it's Latin America. It's, you know, it's Afro-Cuban, it's, it's, sure. uh, it's everything. It's right. not just African and African-American. Right. Um, because the diaspora is... Is everywhere, world. it's worldwide. It's the world. Sure, it's the world. sure. And so, so most of the things that we would see in the museum uh, that would fall into that category now have come into the museum then uh, in, the, in that last 50 years. Uh, that, that collection has grown. Absolutely, we've yeah. made a tremendous uh, contribution to the DIA. Right, right. Which is why we're so important. Right. <laughs> and it's so important to support us. Right, uh, right. Through our fundraising efforts. Uh, the fundraiser, uh, are, are you having the same problems that I hear from other people, other nonprofits who are saying, you know, things are tighter now, people don't have as much money, uh, something like this, it's a great idea, maybe I support it, uh, but maybe I don't have the money. It has been super challenging. Yeah. Even the corporate contributions that we got. I think that once the DIA uh, went through the capital campaign sure. and and got the millage dollars, people assumed that we were, you know, we're You're fine. Now. You got we're all fine. the money in the world. <laughs> but that covers only operations. Right. Only. It doesn't cover acquisitions. It doesn't cover bringing in lectures. It doesn't cover special programming. Right. So we still need the contributions. It's very, very hard. One of the things that we're doing this year is we're offering a late night event. Okay. So for, you know, a fraction of the price of the regular ticket, <laughs> you can come in at nine o'clock. You can still eat. You can right. still drink. You can still party. There's live music. There's DJs, that type of thing to kind of bring more people in, right. especially our young people. I was going to say, young people in, this, in, in particular, I would think, would take advantage of, uh, of that. Uh, let's talk a little more about the collection. Uh, tell me about the, the, the pieces that you think really distinguish uh, this museum uh, in, in, in this particular collection. Oh, sure. Well, um, I would say a lot of our co collection celebrates the diversity of African American art you know, from um, the 19th century up until today, uh -huh. pretty much. Uh -huh. uh, you know, with figurative work, um, landscape work, and work that is, in many respects, very um, Afrocentric, mm -hmm. uh, focused on African, the African-American experience as well. But it pretty much tells um, the history of African-American art. That was really the point of the galleries. I should also point out that um, the uh, galleries at the DIA 
are very unique. We're really the only mainstream fine arts museum that has a department devoted to African American art and a curator. Uh -huh and five de dedicated galleries. So if I went to the Chicago Museum of Art, for example, I wouldn't find a similar, a no. similar kind of... Uh, no, no, but... Uh, why is that, why is that true? I mean, why is Detroit, the, I mean, I can, I can oh, understand why we have it here. Sure. But it's, I guess, hard for me to understand why you wouldn't find it anywhere else. It, it just, um, you know, generally the African-American artists in the collection are shown, of course, in the context of American art, which, of course, they, they are indeed American artists. But um, what happens at a lot of the uh, mainstream museums throughout the country is that only a very tiny percentage of work by African American artists is also included in those is galleries. Is included in those yeah, galleries. Yeah, you might find about five pieces if you're lucky. At the DIA, we have probably about 85 works of art by African-American artists, you know, from uh, realist painting, sure. uh, abstraction, um, you know, sculpture. Uh, but just to show the wide interest mm -hmm. of the African-American artists since the 19th century. Right. And does most of the art come from private collections into the museum? I mean, uh, or is it from other museums? Uh, oh, no. Most of, I would say a lot of the work comes from uh, purchases mm -hmm. that have been made, uh, certainly donations. Uh, the museum started collecting African-American art in uh, around 1943 when the Works Progress Administration, sure. the Federal Arts Project there was disbanding and they donated a lot of the work by so many talented artists to various museums throughout the country. Right. And so the DIA also received some works by um, African American artists right. at that time. Right. Um, uh, what the, uh, talk about some of these other things that the auxiliary does uh, throughout the year. I know about the gala. Uh, Educational programs, uh -huh. certainly for children. Uh -huh. We do lectures. Um, we did an event um, not too long ago, a night at the museum and brought in tons of children. Right, right. Um, the museum is very, very lively. Um, come any Friday night. Right, Friday nights are wonderful at the yes, museum. Yes, absolutely. And especially if you have kids. There's so much different uh, so stuff much going on. Yes, there yeah. are, well, first of all, the chess tournament. Yes, It just right. blows me away to see that. You <laughs> know, know. So many children playing regulation chess. Right, um, right. There are the studios and galleries are open. Uh, their easel set up, you can sit and duplicate a, a work of art right. if you want to do if that. If you tried um, to, absolutely. sure. So there's so many things that the museum offers, not to mention music, live music every Friday. Right, right. Uh, talk about some of the, the, the challenges you see coming up for sort of, I mean, as she mentioned, we've got this this collection that, that we don't have in, uh, in other museums. What do you see sort of down the road as challenges in terms of building that collection or maintaining it uh, you know, as, as head of the auxiliary? Yeah, the big challenge is at one point in time, Bal African was the only game in town for, as, as a black gala. Okay. And now there are many. There are, ma <laughs> there are many. <laughs> and I would imagine and you're getting some competition from the right, uh, which, absolutely. you know, didn't that, exist a long time ago. Healthy. That's yeah, healthy right, competition. Right, sure, right. Absolutely. But there is so uh, much out there competitively to sure. deal with that we no longer have a captive audience. Right. So, you know, you get the whole image of the stodgy museum <laughs> and just trying to pull people in and say, no, we're really not like that. Right. You know, it's a little <laughs> different than that. Yeah. Um, or a lot different than that. Right. It, it's challenging. Right. It's very challenging. W what would you say in terms of the collection? Uh, uh, building that collection, what are the challenges uh, in terms of maintaining this sort of prominence that we have that uh, is unique well, for sure. us. Well, on one hand, we're fortunate to have uh, restricted funds. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we don't have to necessarily raise money for those. They, they've been at the museum sure. for a long time. So I'm also able to use some of that funding um, to purchase works of art. Yeah. Uh, but I think it's particularly difficult um, for uh, the friends sometimes, you know, in trying to raise money sure. enough that uh, myself as well as the African art curator uh, right. to have acquisition right. money. 
Um, yeah, the, the African art gallery, I don't want to leave out my colleague. Nee, <laughs> that's right. You have to talk <laughs> about Nee, who Dr. we've had on the show. Yes. yes. Uh, nee's galleries are beautiful. Yes. Uh, and, and that collection started um, pretty much, you know, when friends came to the museum uh, right. 50 years ago. Right. So, and um, Nee's been building it up since he's been here as well over, I think Nee's been here. I've been here 11 years. I think Nee's been here 10. Okay. But um, they're also uh, beautiful galleries. Yeah. So, is there anything? Up. Is there anything you have your eye on that you that you want to bring uh, to the collection at Detroit that you could tell us about? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> or <is> Generally, <laughs> I do have to kind of keep it a little bit That's of a right. secret. You don't want to but, tell anyone, then they raise the price, right? But but you know, we did buy uh, uh, recently within the past year a work by the artist Fred Wilson. Right. That's right. And uh, you know, Fred was uh, the choice for the Elaine Locke um, International Award, yeah. and uh, he came and did a great talk. But the piece is beautiful. Yeah. Um, so people should go see that. Come see to, it on the sec gonna have to leave second it at floor. That. Okay, great to, to have you guys here. Good luck Thank with you. the gala. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining us. We'd love to hear what you thought about today's program and get your ideas for future shows. So connect with us on Facebook and on Twitter. We'll see you next time on American Black Journal. Lindsay wants to know. So I'm curious, what's DT Energy doing to improve their customer service? Why don't we take a ride over there and let Rachel tell us. Hello. Hello. Take a walk with me. Here at DT Energy, we're working very hard to improve our service, like answering every call under one minute and resolving the issue on the first call. Wow. No passing the buck, huh? Nope. And plus, we're adding over 100 customer service jobs right here in the state of Michigan. I need to get a real job. I'm going to send you an application. Thanks, Rachel. DTE Energy. Know your own power.